Okay, this afternoon is really special. We have two very special people here. I'm absolutely thrilled. Thanks to Doug Shinsato for bringing these guys here. Our first spe our speakers this afternoon are Richard Chung and Raul Thacker, and these guys are quite interesting. But I must say, they're not agriculturists. They're tech people, and they're gonna give us sort of their impressions of what's possible these days from their tech and problem-solving mindset for the ag tech industry. Combined, these two gentlemen have received three Academy Awards for visual technology and animation, plus lots of other stuff. Richard is the founder of D1N0, a startup to leverage creative innovations using advances in technology. He advises lots of technology startups in biomedical engineering and the latest AR, augmented reality. Richard founded CloudPick, a technology company focused in digital content creation and multi-channel deliveries. He's consulted and served as CEO for studios worldwide for projects and business development. Richard was co-founder of PDI, which was part of DreamWorks, over 40 years ago. Richard pioneered the studio's proprietary animation system, for which he received his first Academy Award in 1998, and then he received his second Academy Award in 2016 for his work on the film Shrek, one of my favorites. Richard's expertise is in the latest computer technologies like AR, VR, that's augmented reality, virtual reality, and also AI and machine language. Raul is an Academy Award winner, a hands-on executive, thought leader, and inventor with over 70 patents who specializes in developing technology to process large data sets on the cloud. He's long, he has a long history as an expert in remote sensing and imaging. He's held multiple director level roles at Boeing. Prior to Boeing, he was a member of the R&D staff of the DreamWorks Animation Group, where he created technology for films like Shrek, which won the 2002 Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, Ants, and The Legend of Bagger Vance, in 2016, Raul won the Academy Award for Scientific and Technical Achievement for his groundbreaking design of the DreamWorks Animation Media Review System. Give a big hand for Richard and Raul. Thank you. It, it is really embarrassing when you're hearing this. Um, <laughs> so it's... Uh, First, thank you, Jim, Jason. Yeah, aloha. Everybody. Yeah, aloha, everyone. Um, you know, we are outsiders. So we, we are not tropical ag tech in any way, shape, or form. Um, so we're here. We were inspired by a lot of the conversations here. And we are here to present our ideas, what we thought uh, maybe thinking laterally might help. Uh, so Richard and I, of course, spent decades amongst us building technologies. Um, the interesting thing is Richard was, Richard was the founder of PDI, and I was one of the employees there. And he would always give us impossible problems to solve. So in the R&D team, the research and development team, uh, I think about 70% of the team won an Academy Award. Uh, and we share about 10 plus awards among us, uh, used on over 75 films. I came up with the number 75 because I think we lost count after that. Um, so with that, uh, over to you, Richard. Again, thank you. I think one of the big challenges I faced over the years is how to transfer technology into 
part of the world that needs it or haven't gotten to it. And I see that definitely in the agricultural space. And in the early 2000s, I was set up studio all around the world in countries like India, and I have set up studio in the Philippines and many other countries. And so I've faced that problem before, how to take knowledge that uh, far advanced than these other countries and how to facilitate that transfer of knowledge so everybody can benefit from it. And one thing I learned, I think both Raul and I learned, is that the technology is so complicated, oftentimes it's hard to transfer to a different culture, different learning environment. So hopefully we can come up with some suggestion today that help take all the wisdom of what you've been seeing here in this amazing conference and be able to leverage that into other part of the world where we all can benefit from it. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, and as you see, the, so I, and this, a lot of these problems are very hard to transfer. So Raoud, I think this is your slide, because I didn't push the button. So. Challenges. Oh yeah, okay. We are on all the challenges, okay. Yes, and one thing we learn when we're moving technology out of field is you can't just shove it down their throat, right? I've set up studio and operation in different businesses all around the world, and I spend many years traveling to India, to China, and places like that. And what you realize is you have to respect the culture, you respect their habit, and their way of working. I used to get in this big argument with Hollywood executives where they say, hey, we just tell them how we do things. But that doesn't work. What I always fought for is the respect of how people work in their space. And then what we would go in there and learn to understand how they work and help to make them better with our knowledge. So that's, I think, is the real challenge as we move forward in addressing a lot of these issues that we outline here. So, um, you know, what we're going to talk about is how to plan ahead, right? How do we look ahead? How do we, uh, the, the challenges are hard, and what we need to talk about is how do we monitor the progress that we made, make? How do we get feedback from our consumers, the people who consume our technology, our science? How do we... Um, make it so that the farmers who are already working really, really hard don't have to do this other thing. Uh, how, you know, we need ways uh, for the food producers to actively and cooperatively deal with their own problems themselves. Right? You know, one of the things that you know, Richard would come up to me and, and say is, here's the problem. And we'd say, we, we, nobody has ever solved it. Then why did I hire you in the first place? Figure it out. Right? And if we give what, what I remember us uh, uh, getting were the right tools of the trade, and then we could do magic with very little money because we did not have the hundreds of millions of dollars of budgets that, that larger studios had. So how do we make our technology cost effective? Uh, so you know, one of the uh, things I'm really excited about today is some of the ideas that Richard wanted to toss around and, and uh, kind of talk about. So, Let's see. Next slide, Richard, some of the ideas to ponder. Yes, one of the key things we want to do is come up with ideas that allow people to learn, but also be allowed people to communicate their mistakes. When you have a very hierarchical system, especially in a lot of Asian culture, you tend to not to say you made a mistake. But for me, growing up, in an entrepreneurial environment, you have to learn to make mistakes and learn to communicate that you made that mistake, other people from learn from your mistake. So part of it is trying to come up with a way that we can leverage the knowledge in a way that reinforce the learning process. So let's Next move slide, on. Please. Next slide. So I, I like the idea about the, the kind of the farming social network that acts as an anchor to all things that follow after that. So Richard, over to you. Yeah, well, 
you know, growing up, you know, I spent most of my life in Silicon Valley, there's all these social network and all these things. I looked at some of the ag tech social network out there. You know, there's one called like Ag Fuse, for example, social network performers. But most of these are driven by advertising, right? Not people talking to each other. You really need to create a social network for their own culture, their own environment, that people can communicate with like minds in similar area. But also now you can apply a lot of technology to it. For example, you can apply technology with machine learning. You can basically say, okay, I'm monitoring the, all the land through satellite imagery, but I would only connect people who face similar problem. Like if there's a flood coming, you connect people who are facing that same flood. You can see if crops are dying, connect people who have props problem, right? You can now, using the uh, an AI system to link people actively in real time to problem they're facing, right? Once they have that dialogue going, then the need for solving problem is no longer individual, but a collective. So by building a social network to connect people with the issue they're facing, so you now can be much more proactive in channeling information to the right people. In other areas there is you can have the same system adapt to a weather environment, right? So, so part of that is going to the next slide, we're jumping ahead here, is have this be a geo-managed to connect to satellites. So go ahead. So, so it was interesting when we were discussing about what to talk about here, right? We, we said, hey, look, we have satellite imagery. We have all of these satellites going up. We have amazing data out there. We have drones. You can buy drones at Walmart, and, and you can fly those, and they have geospatial information on them. And you can put all of these images together, and you have all of this incredible data that you can you know, use to, to help uh, uh, the, the tropical farmers. Then drones break, you have to buy them, you have to process that information, you have to hook it up to a USB, you have to charge it. Who's gonna do all of that? We're not gonna sit there and help folks who have dirty hands in wet, yucky climate uh, you know, to, to do all of this stuff. So what do we do? What do they have? We never ask the question, what do they have in order to do their work on their terms? Well, we noticed something, um, at least in India, everyone had a mobile phone, right? Uh, people have mobile phones. So you have your mobile phone, you can take pictures. They have geospatial uh, data in it. Um, you have satellite images that come in from government agencies. And while they are not the latest, greatest information, while you look at a Landsat satellite, which is multispectral in nature, you look at it and say, nice picture, doesn't make sense to me. But that's where you know, technologists like you uh, come to bear, and maybe you could use that information as one dimension, but that's not enough. We, there is something interesting there. There is supply chain data, there is consumption data, how is your stuff being consumed? Uh, you know, economic data, anecdotal data. It was very interesting. Anecdotes provide a large amount of feedback in social networks, right? Anecdotes drive Twitter. Anecdotes drive large organizations. Anecdotal data. And then from anecdotal data, something that Richard pointed out was generational data. The people who, perf who, who do farming are smarter than all of us because they have, you know, they have, they have generational knowledge that has been passed on. Um, and it's interesting that those patterns are quite similar. The problems, let's say, that are happening in Hawaii might have happened in Southeast Asia somewhere, in India, in, in Indonesia, in other countries. How will you connect those farmers to talk to each other so that we are not in the picture? We are not important, right? How, how, would, you, how would we be able to do that? And then the AI and machine learning uh, systems can then become useful where that anecdotal information could be used to influence the outcomes. Um, you know, there is, the, I can geek out for about an hour on this topic because uh, it's, it's fun. But time, so time is a, a dimension that is our ally. We don't think time normally. We think now, 
or yesterday, but we don't think time. Uh, time is important because you can look at change. You can look at change and you can look at behavior over that, that time dimension. You can, um, you know, uh, you can use time as a tool, as a dimension, uh, applying, applying its, uh, uh, it across all the data sets that we talked about, not, not just satellite imagery and change detection and such. It's, you know, the, the supply chain, how is the behavior of the supply chain, how are gas prices in influencing um, things that go from farm to table. Um, you know, we have all of that data, but the correlation is what matters. Um, it's amazing how an Android or an iPhone can become your source of truth, as your source of information. It's worth experiencing that. And then imagine farmers in Indonesia who have that, that, that generational experience are tagging that information using these social networks. And folks uh, you know, on the other side of the planet are getting intelligence out of that anecdotal data. And they're driving some inference out of it. And, um, and, and, you know, the, the thing which we talked about during our conversations as we were building this presentation were two topics. Uh, uh, one was uh, something about exotic crops and the other one was vertical farming. So I'll, I'll move that to you. Okay. Uh, one thing that I think is I didn't, we don't have time to convey to, to, into the detail is in the using of AI and machine learning, you can infer a lot of knowledge with indirect data. Right, by watching over time the behavioral pattern of how a farmer deal with their crop and how the rain pattern is, all that combination can infer a lot of knowledge that will help drive the connection between farmers and their problems and also towards the solution they need. So can we go to the next slide? One area that I'm very excited about is vertical farming. Obviously, as you all know, People in the tropics cannot afford vertical farm, right? Because it really just makes no sense because the, the economics in these really small farm just doesn't add up. But in an area like India, where some of the soil has been so spoiled because they over put too much chemical in it or too much fertilizer in it, they're actually shifting to vertical farm. Not as fancy one, but simpler one because they don't have the soil that can produce the crops they want. But in the other area that vertical farm allows to do is allow farmers to maybe connect, this is the idea we had, is to connect to vertical farm that exists in the more progressive country, you know, with the financial resource, and do remote vertical farming, right? Let's have an exotic crop in the middle of the Pacific that I can, I have the supply chain that affects all the cost issue and everything else, but somehow I can manage that remotely. If I learn to use these simple tools, to manage my farming, I can now manage remote version of my same crop in a farm in, you know, next to Manhattan, and I get a revenue share from that, right? So there are areas like that that may make sense for certain crops that works in the vertical farming, right? But the other thing I thought found was interesting vertical farming that hasn't been used yet is these are the great laboratory to help us plan for changes in climate. As each farmer deal with climate change, we don't know what's gonna happen. But guess what, in a vertical farm, you can build an environment to simulate all possibility very quickly. So you can now build a laboratory that not only do things one way, but multiple way, so you can be prepared for what changes ahead. So there's a lot of use for that. So next slide. Next slide, yeah. And that touches on some of these issues. And I, I talked to a friend that, uh, uh, about, he runs a big vertical farm company. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, nobody can afford this stuff. But at the end, it's a great tool for other usage, for experimental testing new breed of crops and so forth, and be able to test it, and then work with people remotely. And this become a good test bed for that. So, and then especially the aerial panic system is pretty amazing to me. So, so this is where we ask your help, right? We want you to think this over. Um, is, are these concepts sustainable? Uh, is building communication among the folks who are uh, creating the food for us useful? Um, if this is sustainable, how long can this last? Because we are talking about 
um, you know, things that have been happening for over 100, 200, 300 years, and, and now it has led us to here. And we are having these challenges within, within Hawaii, and I'm probably the same kind of challenges across the planet. Um, you know, we still have a problem with supply chain. Uh, tropical regions are hot. They're hot. Um, we are moving food around. And that was something that uh, we talked about. Uh, uh, we talked about, and, and Richard, um, uh, Richard had some opinions on that too. Yeah, I, I think I've, I've been doing a lot of reading recently about all this, right? And one thing that I realize is there are very innovative solutions. Here's just an example of it. I don't know these people, but some guy invented a very simple system to build a refrigerating system using just off-the-shelf stuff you buy at Home Depot. Right now, it gives extended lifespan for crops and the supply chain, but not anything fancy. So there are people out there with cost-effective solution. Right here's just one example where they take regular air condition. He built a very simple, probably a Raspberry Pi-based, you know, control system to maximize the efficiency using existing technology. Right, that's what the world needs. We don't need a lot of really expensive, fancy stuff because in in the real world, a lot of people can't afford this, or they won't understand it, they won't be able to control it. So let's think about simple solution that translate, right? But go to the next slide, please. And the other area that I'm seeing too is all these fancy AI stuff is really coming down in cost, right? I've been involved with a project that I've been used, using, testing out these OKD 3D cameras, some of you might have heard about it, is they taken a machine learning chip and a 3D sensor all put into a little camera that probably costs $100 or so, right? You buy in large volume. So the fancy technology is no longer, uh, you know, not affordable, but they're there. I, I got a bunch of these over the mail for like 100 bucks, of, around $100 each. It might cost a little bit more now. But the technology that give you all these advanced capability are there, but keep an eye out for that. And, and look for a solution that can apply to a broader audience. Next slide, please. So, yeah, I just want to thank two friends of mine who gave me a lot of checks on balances on my stupid idea. Uh, Bruce Borden of FarmWorks and Steve Montoya of Fresh Box Farm, which is a vertical farming company. So I just want to give them a just shout out for that. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for, and, and you know, if, if this has provided any value, these 30 minutes, then we can meet over dinner and, and yap away. Uh, you have two nerds in this room, so yeah. anything related to tech, uh, if you would love to share and teach us, uh, we'd love to learn from you. So thank you very much and mahalo. <laughs>